sorry, resolving everyday conflict. And all of us deal with conflict every day. And if you don't, I don't know how you manage to get exempt. <laughs> but it is a reality. It's something that we face, whether it's under the roof of our home, at our workplace. It is a reality that is tangible to every single one of us. So the first week, Craig started off with glorifying God. How does that correlate with re resolving conflict? Well, it really, really does, because it glorifies God when we resolve conflict. Ryan spoke last week about taking responsibility for me, my part. What do I have to, what have I contributed to it? So today, the heading is confrontation and peacemaking in everyday conflict. So I don't know about you, but when I hear the word confrontation, I just imagine like, like, you know, like, what would you see? You know, that's what I imagine when I hear the word confrontation. That's the first thought that comes to my mind, okay? Like a real toe-to-toe -to -toe standoff, like I'm going to take you on because I'm confronting you. However, as we're going to unpack this, we're going to discover that it's an incredibly biblical thing, that Jesus doesn't just suggest it, he actually instructs it and Use, he directs us to do it. So let's find a scripture to back that up because we want, to know, we want to see that in black and white. So Matthew 18 verse 15 says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. That sounds like victory to me. So from the scripture, we understand that it applies to brothers and sisters, which means it's within community. It's not outside, so it's not the guy at the petrol station. You're not just going to go and tell him and start, you know, bringing something up to him, okay? And when we see sins, when your brother sins against you, you'll see, actually, when you read it, in your Bible, you'll see if your brother or sister sins go and point out their fault. But there's a little letter above it, and you can see that some manuscripts say sins against you. So it could be either or, whether they've just sinned or whether it's against you. So the simplest translation of sins is basically to have missed the mark. What is it to have sinned? We've missed the mark of God's righteousness. That is what sin is. Okay. Bearing in mind the scripture, Romans 14 verse 23 says that everything that does not come by faith or from faith is sin. Okay, so everything. So that eliminates us from having to feel like we are these moral policemen on patrol, like who am I going to confront next, you know? So that releases us of that because everything that is not of faith is sin. So it's okay. Well, you don't know what kind of faith that person's exercising in that area. So we've got three points for today. This is point number one. What is the motivation for confrontation? So before we, right, okay, I'm going to, okay, I've been given license to confront. No, no, no. What is the motivation behind it? It's for peace, for unity, and for reconciliation. Peace, unity, and reconciliation. You see, Conflict resolution and peacemaking is basically just imitating Jesus. He did a heap of that in his three years' worth of ministry. But he did the ultimate by resolving the biggest conflict that there ever was between man and God. Our sin could not stand before his righteousness. And that was the greatest conflict that there was. And Jesus resolved that for us. So 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 to 20 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his very appeal through us. 
Beautiful picture. Beautiful. And we're going to hear more about that next week, so please don't miss it. Part four is reconciliation. It's going to be fantastic. Okay, so that's, that's the part after confrontation. So you see, Jesus, he pursued and per- the perceived pain for long-term reward and benefit. He chased, faced, and embraced death, the discomfort of it, of it for our benefit. So confrontation might not be sunshine rainbows in the moment. It might actually be very uncomfortable. Trust me, it's not going to be as uncomfortable as Jesus hanging on the cross. But there is going to be some kind of discomfort. But because it's for a long-term goal, it's for peace, unity, and reconciliation. So let's take our cue from him. If we look at Hebrews 12 verse 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, joy set before him, he endured the cross. So he didn't enjoy it, he endured it. Sometimes maybe we feel like that when we're at gym. We're enduring it, but it's the joy set before us for the elevated energy levels we're going to have and the better sleep we're going to have and just feeling stronger and healthier and sharper for life. You endure these things, but there's a a long-term goal. So he endured the cross for the joy set before him, which was us, and the fact that we'd be reconciled to the Father. So it's necessary to directly conflict in order to move forward, bring peace, and to find ways to heal, because that's what we're about. With the unified front, so we get to walk forward with the unified front. I was just thinking about it this morning. It won't come up, but Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like an anointing oil, an oil being poured out. I believe that's like an anointing oil. And at the end of it, it says that there is where the Lord will bestow a blessing forevermore. He commands a blessing when there's unity. So firstly, before I am going to confront and before I'm going to try and make peace through this, what I'm going to take on. Now, this, bear in mind, dovetails with what Ryan spoke about last week. And if you want to hear more about that, if you missed it, I want to encourage you to go back um, on the Facebook page. You'll get to see it on YouTube and listen to it about taking responsibility before we get all brazen and want to go out there and, you know, confront. So, How can I take responsibility for me? So how can I resolve the possible conflict, perhaps that is just happening within me, myself, I get to check to see if I've contributed to unnecessary conflict before I actually go and engage with someone else. So here's, so so before I confront, I'm gonna put on this filter, I'm gonna do a little checklist. I I wanna check myself first. Am I perhaps just being critical? Am I being negative? Am I being judgmental? Am I just imposing my opinion? Oh no, no, a drop of alcohol goes past my lips. No, well, well, I have a glass of wine when I have a steak like every two weeks, you know? So where are we imposing perhaps our opinion or are we imposing our personal preference? Oh no, I don't do that, you know? So then we, then we have this legalistic mentality, well, I don't do that, so therefore you shouldn't do that. And we've got to have grace, you know? Okay, we've got to have an understanding. Is it a sin issue? Is it lacking in faith? Are there legal ramifications? Is someone going to get hurt? Is it dangerous? Those are the things. Then we need to keep our personal preference to perhaps ourselves. Or are we being overly sensitive, prickly? Oh, I don't like that, you know, just because it's early. Maybe God's trying to deal with something within us, not necessarily us having to go and deal with then somebody else. We've got to deal with us. Or am I just being bitter? It's just not fair. So I don't know. I feel done in, you know? And that can, you know, sometimes happen within marriages and, and then outwork itself between a husband and wife. Like, it's just not fair. And then there's bitterness and confront off of those grounds. That's not going to be helpful. I read this this week. The version of me you have created in your mind is not my responsibility, okay? But vice versa, let's flip that around. The version of you I have created in my mind is not your responsibility. So if I have an incorrect perspective of you, 
That is not your responsibility, and perhaps I'm just being unfair. So then we need to think about that, and that is perhaps faulty, and that needs changing because we don't operate with stinking thinking. Over and above all of this, we need to factor this in. We've got to think about Ephesians 6. It speaks about not being unaware of the devil's schemes. You see, the devil has got schemes which we need to be so aware of before we want to confront a brother on something. See, he loves to rob, kill, and destroy, as it says in John 10.10, 10, and set up delusional, deceptive thoughts toward others within us to create brokenness. He wants to trip us up. He wants to rob our peace. And he wants to cause conflict within us primarily and then beyond, then in, within relationships and the greater body, you know. He, the enemy thrives off division, okay. It was his, his first game, game plan. It was what he did in the garden. He thrives off division, okay. So we want to defy that by resolving conflict through confrontation and fiercely loving peacemaking. So he doesn't have a ground to stand on. Here's another thing. My happiness and peace is not your responsibility and vice versa. Your happiness and your peace is not my responsibility. And I think this is a huge one with husbands and wives because this can cause unnecessary conflict and confrontation because of an unfounded expectation of contention within marriages. You are the person who's meant to be making me happy and bringing me peace. That's unfair. I've got to find that within myself and then that's what I bring. That's what I bring. I can't expect it from you. Otherwise, there will always be unmet, dis, uh, unmet expectation. When there's unmet expectation, there is disappointment. Then there's division and, and, and. So we need to look at each other. This thing about seeing through the eyes, just, I was just processing it this morning. Such a beautiful concept. It's just thinking through this with the Lord, and it just came out through the worship. This is what I've got in my notes. So we need to look at each other, remembering that each of us are created in the image of God and aim to see people through the eyes of Jesus. I want to look through his lenses at people. And that's what I was just, this morning, I loved what happened in the worship. It's amazing. We look, you see, he looks at us with fierce love, freedom, and liberty. Okay, so... When we confront, it is with the intention of peacemaking. If it's not, then it's to break down, and that's fleshly, and that's not okay. That's not helpful. That's unhealthy. So listen to this. Jesus declares, look what he declares us to be when we are peacemakers. Matthew 5 verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When we are peacemakers, we are blessed. Sometimes that's why households aren't being blessed or there doesn't feel like there's much blessing because there's a lot of peacekeeping happening instead of peacemaking. If you're going to be putting stuff under the carpet and just sweeping it under the carpet, you've got to know one day you're going to be tripping over that carpet. And we've seen it happen in couples who've been married for 20, 30, 40 years. Husbands need to be liberated to lead. And sometimes that means by leading, and that is peacemaking. It's not peacekeeping just so that there's peace and happiness in his wife's little world because it's a pseudo peace and it's a pseudo happiness and it's not going to last because it's circumstantial. There has to be an underlying peace and happiness. Wives submitting to the husbands, there is going to be peace. When there is peace making within a household, there is going to be blessing. I love it when Craig confronts me. I love it because it brings peace within me, which means peace into our environment. He would be doing me a disservice if he was not confronting me. 
He would not be being a good husband if he weren't confronting me just because he didn't want to upset me and just didn't want to like, you know, upset the apple cart or like, you know. It, it would not be beneficial for us in our household. The Holy Spirit, I love the fact that he confronts us. I love it. So there's those times when you just know that you know that you know that you shouldn't be doing that. And he just speaks to you. Why? Because he's our comforter and he's our counselor. In those moments, he's confronting us before we're going to do something that's lacking in faith and just going to be detrimental to us. He's so ever-present. He's so there and speaking to us. So Galatians 6 verse 1 to 5 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit... And the other translations say, you who are spiritual should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burden. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks that they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. So we've got to rightly adjust where am I coming from with this? Am I doing it because I'm being judgmental and thinking I'm better than the person? Or am I doing it for their freedom to make peace, see unity, and have reconciliation? Each one should test their own actions. There we go. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. I've always used to say comparison. I know the spelling's different, but it's like a sin when there's comparison because it's just unhelpful. You are made to be you. The world needs you as you are, not as you think you should be because somebody else is how they are. Number two, big point number two, we can take advantage of confronting as an opportunity when we see that confrontation is for restoration, not condemnation. This is very important, friends. We're not going to confront someone because we want to condemn them. That's just fleshly. That's not building them up. That's breaking them down. And that is not working in cohesion with, with what the Spirit wants to do. That's not, that's not unity. So I grew up in circles and was trained in this in terms of where we spoke about Matthew 18, 15, so where someone would start miffing about someone and the other person would say, well, did you Matthew 18, 15 him? Like, you know, like Matthew 18, 15, sort him out, you know. But bear in mind, that shouldn't really be the, 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 the premise that a person should be speaking from. It should be when the person comes and says, hey, you know what Fred did the other day? Like, he just ignored me. In fact, I think he just fobbed me off. Like, honestly, I just think he was just rude to me. He was just mean. Then, a moment of, not the previous one that I've just described, should be, have you gone to him with Matthew 18, 15? Because if you haven't, basically, and maybe you tell someone or you don't have to tell someone or maybe you just gently guide them and lead them in this way because if they haven't and they're coming to you they are being completely and utterly unbiblical in that moment they are being divisive fleshly slanderous because what does Matthew 18 verse 15 say if your brother or sister sins or sins against you go and point out their fault listen to this just between the two of you if you've now got another party involved, you have completely defied scripture. And as I said, I don't know what he called it, ubly dublies or something or something. It's like taking charcoal, trying to wipe it down on the bride of Christ and just robbing from her beauty, just, uh, just causing spot and blemish on this beautiful, pure bride that Jesus paid such a price for that we get to participate in beautifying. So that should be it. It should be, and we've had to do that sometimes. Well, have you chatted to the person? You know, before, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you carry on, you know, they're not here to defend themselves. Have you actually chatted to them about it? Because if you haven't, this is unresolved. You need to go and chat to them. Then there are steps to take after that where someone else can get involved if the need be. So it's just redirecting them. Also, how it's received. When we understand that a person is not confronting to condemn, then we don't have to be like, what? Huh? 
What'd she come and say to me? You know? I was chatting to someone the other day and they were like, yeah. And it was almost like they were guarding themselves. It wasn't even a confrontation. It was just a leadership thing. But it was almost like there was such a guardedness like, okay, yeah, yeah. Because they felt that they might have to. But we are doing this thing in love. And, we, and it's only for mutual benefit and a long-term vision. So we don't have to be guarded because we're not doing things to break down. We're doing things to build up with a common, we're one spirit, one, one vision. See, so Jesus has a way more flexible and beneficial way of how to resolve conflict rather than just standing toe to toe with another one, another person describing their sins and telling them telling them off and telling them what they've done wrong. He's got a way more beautiful approach. So I just want to enlighten us as to what Matthew 18 verse 15 is sandwiched between just to get a perspective of this. Matthew 18 verse 12 to 14 which precedes Matthew 18 verse 15 is such a wonderful metaphor of the loving shepherd going and looking for his lost sheep and then celebrating when it's found. That is the heart of the Father. Leaving the 99 to go look for the one. So that is, that's what precedes Matthew 18 verse 15. And then what comes after it, what follows it, from Matthew 18 verse 21 to 35, again, is all about restoration. In the parable of the unmerciful servant, and it starts with the question, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? So Jesus has posed this question. So in verse 22, he replies, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And other um, translations say 70 times seven. Just like lavish, lavish forgiveness, man. You want to sit and quantify oh, seven times. Oh, one forgiveness. No, no, 70 or 70 times seven. So, point number three, last point. Points when attempting to resolve conflict. Some checkpoints that we can see. You see, when we are going to speak about conflict, Ephesians 4 verse 13, it's not going to come up there. I just thought about it this morning. No, Ephesians 4 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. It's all speak the truth in love. If you're not going to speak the truth in love, don't speak it because that will be damaging and you don't want to harm the bride of Christ, someone within, this is a brother or sister we're dealing with. Another one that I thought of was 2 Corinthians, again, it won't come up, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So when we confront, you think about a, a bar brawl. I mean, I was a barmaid for years and years and years. Red Dog, I saw enough fights. Uh, I was a barmaid at Ragamuffins. I saw enough fights for a lifetime. They are confronting on a way of the world with weapons, but our weapons, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. If that's the case in someone's life and they're going down a road of destruction, I want to intervene and stand alongside them for the sake of love, to confront them, to bring peace. So here's some quick points before we're going to confront. Here's some checkpoints that we can use. Pray for humility and wisdom. Plan your words carefully. Think of how you'd want to be confronted. Anticipate likely reactions and plan appropriate responses. Like rehearse it. Choose the right time and place. Talk, to the per talk in person whenever possible. Sometimes a phone call has to be made, but preferably so they can see you and receive it and understand it. Don't do it. Well, we learned this many years ago in marriage, marriage stuff. Don't do it when you're hungry. Don't do it when you're under time constraints. And don't do it when you need the loo. 
Okay. Assume the best about the person until you have facts to prove otherwise. This is prizing them. This is honoring them above yourself. Listen carefully. Speak only to build others up. Ask for feedback from the person. Do you understand this? Am I, do you understand? Do you see where I'm coming from? So they can get a picture and an understanding and a perspective of what we're saying. Recognize your limits. So don't be fl- flustered or frustrated when you don't see a change in them. Sometimes God can only be the, the change in a person. Romans 12 verse 17, last scripture Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on everybody else around you, no. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, this is responsibility. Live at peace with everyone. No drama. There's no accident going happening here. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Fierce love with the intention for peace, unity, and reconciliation. Those are the things. So, time for a quick story. Okay, and this is it. So, a little while ago, I had a, 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 something that I had to confront someone with. They, they were heading in a direction that was not only going to be destructive to them personally, there was legal implications as well. So, I would not have been a faithful friend if I had not gone alongside them. I wouldn't have been a faithful sister to this person if I hadn't have spoken to them about this. The Holy Spirit was prompting me and I knew it was something that I needed to do. So I chatted to this person and they they'd made decisions to go down this path. So I had to speak to them about some stuff in confrontation. Was it awkward? 100%. Was it difficult? 100%. Walking away, I don't know if they were going to receive it or reject it. I don't know. I went away 24 hours. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed that they would heed that instruction because it would mean unraveling some of the stuff that they'd already done. So it's like it was, it was going to be huge. So I just had to leave it in the Lord's hands. I tell you, when that person got hold of me 24 hours later, they had changed the direction that they were going in and had removed themselves from that decision and taken a completely different path, a path of righteousness, a path of trusting in the Lord, a path of faith, a path of of life and glory. No destruction. Yes, there was going to be ramifications. Yes, there was going to be consequences. But can I tell you what their resolve was once they made that decision? The peace that prevailed left them sobbing and in tears. They were such a release of peace. That is an example of confrontation for the sake of the person yearning and longing that they would walk into a place of freedom and be liberated and not into bondage. So why don't you join me in standing, babe?